In the book of Isaiah, chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Destroying demonic clusters. This is a subtitle from the hideous and deceitful spirit of pride. Have you ever noticed no one ever admits they have it? Have you ever noticed that? No one ever says, I'm pride. I've got a whole heart full of pride. No one ever says that. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 2, these words. Shake yourselves from the dust and arise. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck. O captive daughter of Zion. Tell the person next to you, loose yourself. Tell the person on the other side, just loose yourself. You know, it's often funny how we wait for everybody else to come and bring deliverance to us. Let me read it to you again. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down on Jerusalem, loose yourself from the bonds of your neck. In other words, you become stiff neck. O captive daughter of Zion. The word Zion is a prophetic symbol of the church today. The word loose means to disjoin, divorce, separate, unhitch, disconnect, detect, unseat it, unbind, free, release, break in pieces, and demolish. So Jesus said, in my name you shall cast out demons. So Jesus said, loose yourself. He said, separate yourself, detach yourself, disconnect yourself, unseat yourself, unbind yourself, release yourself, break in pieces yourself, and demolish it yourself. That's what Jesus said. Well, let's just call the pastor. Well, honey, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, you're having a manifestation. Then we're just going in and loose yourself. I'm going back to bed. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, in verse 17. And these signs will follow them that believe. So Jesus said, there are signs that will follow you if you believe it, and he says, in my name, you'll cast out demons. Now, I suppose, I don't know what that would look like if I was to go sit down at the kitchen table and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I recognize that I've got a different law working in my members called pride. I got a prideful heart and a very arrogant, arrogant attitude and a haughty look, and I am so sorry for it. Now, I loose myself from it before destroying my relationship, destroy my home, destroy everything that I'm doing, all that you have blessed me with. I loose myself, I untie myself, I unseat myself from it in the name of Jesus. I want to walk in your power and your strength. I will walk in pure humility. So Lord, I loose myself from it now in the name of Jesus and I command you to come out of me, be uprooted out of me and be gone. You will not ruin my heart. You will not ruin my life and you will not ruin my home. Go now in Jesus' name. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said do. He says, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out demons. And guess what he said? Then you'll speak with a new tongue. Then there's something to say. You'll have a praise in your mouth instead of condemnation in your mouth. You'll have a, something good in your mouth to say instead of something bad to say. And I'm not mad at nobody. I'm just simply trying to help somebody. So I even make it easier for you. I'm just talking to myself. You happen to be in the audience. You see, the only way I understand this, because I used to be bound with a proud look. 
I don't know about you, but I think every Christian, in my opinion, in fact, it's not my opinion, it's what I know. Every person that names the name of Christ need to go through the limits. You know, just because you got saved don't mean everything fell off. Don't mean everything went away. You still cuss like a sailor. You still get mad. You still get angry. Some of you still drinking. Some of you still smoking. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm talking about me. I mean, are you listening to what I'm saying? So just because you said Jesus come into my heart don't mean everything was all right. Right. I got, oh my God. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So what do that mean? That means that I'm going to tell you just about it. Look what it said. In the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul wrote these words. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, outbursts, and blasphemies with all malice. Oh boy. Oh boy. He just didn't say it. Now he said it has a root of malice. You know what malice is? I'll get you. Mm -hmm. You got me today, but I'll get you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Next time this conversation, oh boy. And all of a sudden, the heart now is filled. And guess what? Guess what is driving this? Guess what the force is driving that? Pride. Instead of humbling yourself and accepting wrong, pride says, you don't know who I am. Mm, I'll teach you. Don't you know who I am? Look at me. You, I mean, you just have to go look in the mirror and say, hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? They don't know. I mean, they don't see all this. <laughs> you know, I need to go back in there and look, see all this here. Who you think you're talking to? Are you, are you listening to me? You see pride rise up in your heart. And then all of a sudden malice is there. Mm -hmm. I get you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get you. I never did like your mama nowhere. I'm going to get you. I mean, you know, all these things start running in your heart and in your mind. And this malice. And all of a sudden is seeded now and a root takes place. And then all of a sudden a cluster Come. Let's revisit the scripture. Hold your finger there in, in Ephesians. We're going to come back to it, but let's revisit the scripture that we did last week in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Let's just revisit that just for a moment. Matthew chapter 12. When you arrive, they'll say amen. Matthew starts with an M. <laughs> Verse 43. Look what it says. Now, let me just pause and pray because I just feel, I feel it rising up. You don't like what I'm saying. So, Father, I just pray. I just pray that they get delivered now because pride, the spirit of pride, I can feel it rising up. I don't like you talking to me like that. So, Lord, I just pray grace upon their mind and their thoughts in Jesus' name. So, in Matthew chapter 12, you know, you can feel pride when it rises up, you know. You know, it, you know, it get that, it get that, that, that pharisaical look. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Mm. So anyway, in verse 43, look what it says. We revisited this from last week. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man or a person, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and he finds none. In other words, Jesus said, this is spirit. He says, it's a hideous spirit, a deceitful spirit of pride. And he says, when it, when it goes out of a man, it walks around in dry places and is seeking rest. Demonic spirits will never find no rest because of their master, Satan. He would torment them continuously. And he says he finds rest and he finds none. Then he says, I will return to the house from which I came. Look at that. He says, I will. So we know that demonic spirits have a form of of will, that has some form of will to make a decision. So he says, I will go back to my house. So he has claimed the host. Who is the host? You or someone else. It's because the host is the person. Just like you are the host of your spirit and your soul, both your spirit and your soul live in this house, this house called the earth suit, the body. And so he says, I will go back to my house. He says, from which I came. He took residence in the host. He took residence in the house. 
And he says, I'm going to go back to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds that it's empty, swept, and put in order. In other words, the person did something to change their life. And the demon says, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like you going down to that women's Bible study. I don't like you going over there. You know, you're always playing music, going to that church. You know, I don't like it. Where are you going this week? I mean, I don't like it. Every time I turn, you're going somewhere. So he comes back and says, you went somewhere and something happened. You know, like when you come in your, your, your kid's room, you know, and they cleaned it up. And you're like, uh-oh, oh, what happened? <laughs> something happened. Why? And so he comes back. He's seen this put in order. Clothes are picked up, hung up in the closet. Shoes are put in their place. So he sees that something's been put in order. And he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits, more wickeder than himself. And then he enters and he dwells there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be in this wicked generation. In this wicked generation. If my grandmother was here, she would just shake her head. So I've never seen people as crazy as they are today. Do you understand that? People have just absolutely lost their mind. Do you understand that? I mean, they don't have any more respect anymore, where they are, who they are. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. People have lost their mind. So he says, I will go back to the house, to the holes from which I came. And listen to it, he's bragging no sense. Listen, he's bragging about it. And then he says, I'm going to go get some reinforcements. In other words, I'm going, to, I'm going to go get a cluster of other demons. And we're going to come back and we're going to destroy this host. Why? Because something happened that caused me to be cast out and he didn't like it. He had a haughty look. Now, let's go back to the book of Ephesians 4, verse 31. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, outbursts, and blasphemies with all malice, he says, be taken away from you. Please turn to the book of beginnings. We all know that's the book of Genesis. Go to the book of beginnings, chapter 4. Very interesting story that we're going to find there. Genesis chapter 4, let's begin with verse 1. Now Adam knew his wife, and she, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now obviously, she was happy about having a male child, which means that Adam and Eve probably had daughters before they had Cain, because she was happy about having a male. And then she bore again, and this time it was Abel. So Cain and Abel must have been twins. She bore them both at the same time. Now Abel was a keeper of the ground, but Cain was a, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, growing up, something happened, in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought the first fruit of the flock of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. In other words, Cain got an attitude. Cain didn't like it that God had more respect for his brother's offering and not his. And the reason for that being, we know when we come to the New Testament, without the shedding of blood, there was no remission for sin. So Adam must have taught his children about, about sacrifice because they had an altar and they brought it to a certain place. It was a designated time that they brought that offering to the Lord. Well, he had no respect for Cain's offering because Cain brought a curse product to the Lord. Now, if you have to know that by going back to chapter 3, going back to chapter 3 and looking at verse 17. Then Adam, then Adam said, because you have heeded, the, then then to Adam, he said, God talking to him, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree for which I have commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground. So he said, curse is the ground. So now Cain brings 
his offering to the Lord. He brings his offering. His offering was cursed. So he brought a cursed offering to the Lord and he wanted to present that cursed offering as a blessing to God. And God said, no, I have already cursed the earth. He says the fruit of the earth is already cursed. Cain, why would you bring a cursed thing to me? I want you to keep that in mind because I wonder how many cursed things we present to the Lord. So let's go back. Let's go back to the verse 6. And so he said to the Lord, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why have your continents fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? You know, it's like, it's like you know, kids don't understand why they get spankings. Well, if you do well, will it not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you and you should rule over it. Now, look what he says to him. He tells him, one translation says that a demon is crouching at the door but you shall rule over it. In other words, I'm giving you authority and power to rule over this demonic spirit. And so God tells him, but it's crouching at the door of your life. Cain, why have your continents fallen? In other words, Cain, you got a bad attitude and your heart is full of pride. If you would humble yourself and bring that offering to me right, then I will respect it and bless your life. But he brought to him a curse offering and said, God, bless it. My daddy taught me to do this, so I'm just doing what he taught me to do. Now I expect you to bless it. And God says, no, Cain, it don't work that way. He says, this is the way you shall approach me. When you come into my house, you should enter into my gates with thanksgiving. You should come into my courts with praise. And you shall give praise and honor and glory unto me. Anything else is not accepted in my presence. Anger is not accepted in my presence. Lying is not accepted in my presence. Loose life is not accepted in my presence. All those things was not accepted in his presence. So he says, when you come into my presence, you should have done your due diligence at home before you got here. You should have took communion before you got here. You should have asked God to purge your heart, to cleanse your heart. So you should have come in through my door with thanksgiving and about time pray, praise in my name because I am good. I am glorious. I'm powerful. I'm I'm almighty. You have no need that I cannot feel. He said, this is how you should approach me. Are you listening to me? But we come burdened down. We come late. Now, listen, I don't, demean, I, not, don't, I don't mean to demean anybody's issues. But I am saying a home that prays, a parent that prays, a family that prays, a husband and wife that prays can walk into the house of God with joy in their heart, praising God because he's good, loving God because he's wonderful, giving him glory and giving him praise. Why? Because he's an awesome, almighty God. And I'm so glad to be in the house to praise you with the rest of the body and the congregation of the saints. I come in here with my joy this morning. I bless your holy name because you are powerful and great and nothing can be withhold from your hand. And I come in here and declare all things are possible to him that believes. I know it's going to be better for me on Monday. It's going to be great greater on Tuesday. On Wednesday, everything is going to be possible. And you see, when you know who he is. So he says, let's go back to the verse, verse 9. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? We got another issue to talk about. Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And listen to that little prideful thing. I mean, it's just as arrogant as can be. Mm-hmm. You ought to know. You God. <laughs> don't you know? Nothing can be hid from you. You ought to know. You don't want my offering. You asking me about my brother. What is wrong with you? You need help. <laughs> Listen to that little ugly thing talking to God. Can you imagine that? No, I'm sure you can. And look what it says. And he said, what have you done? 
He wants Cain to know. I know what you've done, Cain. You're not your brother's keeper. You are your brother's murderer. What have you done? You see? And look what he said. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth from which, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Listen to that. The earth opened up to receive the blood. And let's go on. Now keep that in mind on Calvary's cross when his blood hit that earth. Why? Because the blessing destroys the curse. And all it took was the blood to hit the ground. And look what he says. He says, when you till the ground, he says, it would no longer yield its strength to you. He was under a curse now. He says, all the rest of your life, this ground will never yield its fruit to you because you are under a curse. Oh, my goodness. And a fugitive and a vagabond, you will be on this earth. If you are operating in a generational curse, I wonder why you're not getting any answers to your prayers and you're not getting any breakthrough in your life. Then you need to renounce the curse Repent of the spirit of pride and ask God to forgive you. And then renounce the kingdom of darkness. Hear that? Repent, renounce, and then break its power and its influence off of your life. The spirit of pride. Well, let me go on. I want to read verse 13. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Can you imagine that? He says, surely... You have driven me out this day from the face of the ground, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. God says, no, I'm not going to even allow anybody to kill you in the next verse. He says, I won't even allow anybody to kill you. Everybody to see you came will not touch you. You will have to live for by what you have done. You see, when you live under a curse, you will wander around like a vagabond when you are living under the curse. I want you to hear that. And nothing you, everything you put your hand to will not, will not produce its full fruit to you. And you're wondering why. Wondering why. I get to bless it on this hand and everything I get out of this hand is taken, it's being gone by this hand. Why? Because you get the blessing. God is good. He will bless you in this hand, but you have to use the blessing to pay off the curse. And you wonder why your house ain't full. You wonder why your storehouse is not full. Could it be you're under a curse and operating in one? Well, let's go on. The spirit of pride and bitterness, here's another one now, acts as a doorkeeper. Now, we'd have to go back to Genesis. Remember, God told Cain, he said, there is something crouching at the door. And its desire will, remember, remember the soul is the what? The mind, the will, and the emotion. So its desire, this demon has a will. It desires you, Cain. It desires you. You know, the my scripture said in the book of Isaiah that hell beneath is excited about your coming. Can you imagine hell being excited about you? I can't. I can imagine heaven being really excited about me, but not hell. So God tells him, he says, there's a demon crouching at the door of your life, the porthole or the gate of your life. And we know what those are. What was that? We're going to talk about those in just a few minutes. So the spirit of pride and bitterness. Now we're going to add the root of bitterness to the spirit of pride. Remember, we're talking about demonic clusters. So the spirit of pride and bitterness acts as a doorkeeper. It will make a person hostile, antagonistic, and argumentative. It erodes relationships, the spirit does, and this root, it taints perception, and it contaminates anointing, and it hinders the liberty of the spirit. Bondage 
is a condition where a person is placed in a subjudiation to an owner or a master whose emotion, psychologically and physically, restrained by a force, a power, or an influence. It's a hideous and deceitful spirit to keep you from living in the abundant life. Now, I know that sounds like a mouthful to you, but it's master. In other words, it wants to keep you from living the abundant life of joy. It wants to hinder your thought life, constantly keep you thinking about negativity. And so if you think about negativity, then you talk about negativity, and then your words will cancel out everything you said you believe God before. Why? Because it's not a faith. And so your negative words now become fearful words. And God has not given you a spirit. You know, God could have said, I haven't given you an emotion of fear. God could have said, I haven't given you a mindset of fear. God could have said, I didn't give you the words of fear. God could have said all of those things, but he didn't say that. The Holy Spirit said, I had, God has not given you a spirit of fear. But of love, love is a spirit, power is a spirit, and a sound mind is a spirit. You know, people just don't have good sense anymore. You ever notice that? You know, sometimes people are dumber than a sack of rock. A sack of rock got more sense than some people. You know, I mean, you know, you just shake your head. You, all you got to, you don't believe me, just watch the way some people drive. You know, you be like, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you understand that? You have to shake off the spirit of rage. Ain't that something? So God has not given us the spirit of what? Fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Too many believers live like victims in problems they have created. And that'll make you have to think for a minute. I don't know what you're blaming somebody else. They didn't create that problem. You did. And then you're going to become a victim to your own problem. How confusing can we be? Now, if that, ain't, if that ain't stupid going dumb, I don't know what it is. Are you listening to me? Look at the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. We're going to be coming up with a, in our school in Kingdom Leadership Academy, coming up soon in the fall possibly. We're going to be doing an eight-week class on demonology 101. You want to make sure you're in that class. And so in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 12, these words. Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but also in my absence, work out your own salvation. With fear and... Wait a minute. What? 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 Are you saying I have some responsibility? Oh, no. Don't you know I've been infected by the irresponsibility, the spirit of irresponsibility? I don't know anything about responsibility. So what do you mean, work it out? Didn't Jesus already do it for me when I gave my heart to Jesus? Didn't he say it was finished on the cross? Yeah, Jesus said it was finished, but he never said you were finished. So look what he says. He says, let me read it to you again. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The primary Greek definition for the word salvation in this passage is soteria, S-O-T-E-R-I-A, which means rescue and deliverance from the molestation of demons. Uh-oh. Molestation of what? Demons. That is the root definition for soteria. Work out your own salvation from the molestation of demons. Oh boy. How are we molested by demons? Now let me say it again. Rescue, deliverance, and the molestation of demon, which makes it perfectly clear that Jesus has delivered our spirit from the power of Satan 
But now he tells us to work out our own deliverance until we free both the soul and the body from demons. Remember, demonic demons or demons cannot live in your born-again spirit, but they can inhabit your soul. Remember, the soul is the what? The mind, the will, and the emotion. You know, people, people can have demons in their mind. Did you know that? You know, I did a funeral for a young man who was selling dope. Everybody on, everybody on the street knew he was just a dope dealer, you know. And, and every time I see him, he, he, he'd come up to me and, you know, he, he'd give me a, a handful of money and say, Pastor, just pray for me. Pastor, just pray for me. Pastor, pray for me. Well, he died. You know, some people gunned him down and he died. And, and I was asked to do his funeral. And you know what's so amazing about it? But, you know, you're trying to help people think, well, this guy can't be in heaven, you know, because all the bad things that he done. Look at his lifestyle. He couldn't have been in heaven. But let me just tell you that there are times when the heart can be so right and the mind can be so wrong. Did you hear what I said? The heart can be so right, but the mind can be so wrong. In other words, people can have demonic activity go on and that affects the way they think. And that's why the scripture encourages us to do what? Renew our mind. You understand that? Please understand it because that's important. Because if you don't understand how the soul functions, the psyche functions, then you will constantly be in this mind frame of judging everything with negativity and not seeing it as the scripture says. You say, well, we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. We just judge this fruit. Well, just hold on, I'll get to that in a minute. So Jesus told us, now I'm gonna seal this whole situation here about your spirit. The Holy Spirit, he said, it's to your advantage that I go away and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to reconcile your spirit. Remember, God is a spirit. God is spirit. He's not a spirit, but God is spirit. And so he says, now I'm going to reconcile your spirit, man. Why? Because my spirit and my soul at death leaves this earth suit and it goes back to be with the Lord. It goes back into the presence of God. Nobody can live. I'll have a new body. Okay, I have a celestial body. You know, I have a body that can walk through walls, you know, walk through windows, walk, walk, walk in and out of prison, walk in and out of doors. I mean, I'm going to have one of them kind of bodies. Me and Charles just going to be walking through stuff. You know, we're just going to go everywhere. Why? You know, we ain't going to need no key, no alarm system, no nothing. You know, we're just going to pop up, just, you know, pop up in your bedroom. I mean, we're just going to walk through stuff. You know, are you listening to me? So, so, so that's the kind of body we're going to have. And, and so Jesus says, he says now, now that I've taken care of that, I've given you my authority, I've given you my word, I've given you my grace, I've extended my mercy to you, I've given you supernatural power, I've given you my anointing, these, these miracles are going to follow those who, that believe, you shall lay hands on the sick, they shall recover, you shall cast out demons, you shall speak with new tongues, you know, all things will be possible to you. In other words, he says, you're going to have to live now the supernatural life. You'll live the supernatural life now, you see? And so now he says, now that I've done all that for you, he says, now work it out. Work it out, okay? So, so what does that mean? So we're going to talk about that. He says, so the word soul, we know, is psyche, meaning the self-life. That's what it means. The emotions or the, in the, in the, the intellectual or the will life, the strong will life, the desire, the, the self-life. You know, the self-life is the one I don't want God to be in control of. You know, I'm in charge, God. Don't come unless I invite you. That's the self-life. Are you listening to me? I can do this like I want to. You know, preacher, you got it all wrong. Well, you know, the scripture said, well, you know, that ain't what it meant. That's the self-life. You know, why did you bother to ask me if you didn't want me to tell you? That's the self-life. You see, how many times have we heard a song sung, a message preached, or a nice speech about fixing the man in the mirror? As cliche as it sounds, that is some of the best advice we could ever receive. 
is fixing the man in the mirror. We should continually, continually use the mirror of God's word to examine our self-life. Six requests David asked of the Lord in Psalms 137. In Psalms 139, excuse me. There were six requests that David asked of the Lord in Psalms 139, beginning with verse 24. David said these words, 23 and 24. He says, search me, O Lord. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxiety, my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Now, can you imagine praying that prayer to God? I mean, it really takes a lot of boldness and confidence to pray that prayer. David said, search me, number one. Number two, he says, know my heart. Number three, he says, test me. I listen, David said, test me. And let me say to you about being tested, because faith that can't be tested is faith that can't be trusted. And he, so David says, God, I want you to test me. I want you to test my faith. You know how your faith is tested? I really love, I love the church, and you know, we're going to help you. We're going to help you, Apostle, until you get the big check. It ain't the little check. You know, the little check, you know, I'll give you $10. You know, this thousand, I give you a hundred things ain't too tight. You know, but if you get the big check, if you get the big check, and you say, well, your wife said, honey, well, you know, 10% of that is $25,000. You take that to the church. What? <laughs> About to have a heart attack. Do what? Take what? Where? You got to be kidding. <laughs> you want that yard fixed, don't you? <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm trying to say to you? You see, you see, all of a sudden, this is one of the most dangerous prayers you'll ever utter out your mouth. Test me, God. And when he does, will you fall short? Well, let's go on. Search me, know my heart. Number three, test me. Number four, know my thoughts like he does it. Number five, see if there be any demonic activity in me. See if there be anything, any wicked way in my thoughts, in my heart, in my faith walk, in my journey with you that's wicked. See if there be anything in me that might lead me to the dark side. See if there may be anything in me that may be considered demonic or have demonic activity. So he says, test me, know me, try me, know my thoughts, examine me, and then see if I'm practicing any form of a wicked way. No show of hands, but how many of you are prepared to pray that prayer? Then he said, then after all of that, lead me in the way. Lead me. In the, after all of that, God, I need you to lead me in the way. Lead me in your way so that I don't live my life in your way. So he says, lead me in your way. In the book of James, chapter 1. I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. James chapter 1, beginning with verse 22 and 25, these words. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. For that is the essence of self-deception. Uh-oh. So always let the word be like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. If you listen to the word and don't live out the message you hear, you become like the person who looks in the mirror of the word to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. You perceive how God sees you in the mirror of the word, but then you go out and forget the divine origin. But those who set their gaze deeply into the perfecting law of liberty 
are fascinated by and strengthened by it, and they experience God's blessing in all that they do. And 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 from the Passion, Tra Passion Translation, these words. Then I'm going to read verse 6. The Holy Spirit had explicitly revealed at the end of this age, many will depart from the true faith, one after another, devoting themselves to spirits of deception, seducing spirits, and following demonic inspired revelation and theories. Hypocritical liars will deceive many and their conscience won't bother them at all. In other words, their conscience will be absolutely seared from the truth. Seared like a hot iron. Everybody know where seared is, don't you? One day I was on a pair of pants. I had it on cotton, but there was linen. You understand that, don't you? So if you ever on, the ladies are laughing because they know what that did. And so, so then I turned around and do something, you know, but, you know, didn't think the iron was that hot. And I turned back around and guess what happened? They were burned up. They were seared. I was so mad. I liked them pants. <laughs> you know, I couldn't walk around with a big old orange spot on my pants. Why? Because it wouldn't come out. Couldn't wash it out. Couldn't cut it out and put a patch on it. It was seared. That's how some people's conscience are today. They sear. You can speak the truth to them, but their conscience is seared. Are you listening to me? It's like telling people the truth. Say, well, don't do this. Vote this way. I'm just going to use that as an example. Don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, don't get hurt on me now. I, I'm just saying. I'll, I'll use it. Well, let's just use another something so that you don't get all up in the uproar. You know, but, 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 but you tell people the truth, and they can be looking at the wall, and you say, there's a wall there. No, it ain't. <laughs> yes, it is. There's, there's a wall. There's a wall. There's a wall there. And they said, no, it ain't. And you say, well, that's not the door. But then they said, there's wall there. I don't see no wall. Well, the wall is made of glass. So, you know, but there's no door there. You don't see the door. Why? Because if you get over here on this side, the door will open for you. But there's a wall there. No, it ain't. And then they run right into the wall. <laughs> Some of y'all laughing because you did that. <laughs> you thought it was the door. I, I, yeah, I'm laughing because I did it. So are you listening to me? So look at verse 6. He, look what verse 6 is that 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, if you would teach the believers these things, that there's a wall there, you will be known as a faithful and a good minister of Jesus, Jonathan Bird, the anointed one. Nurture, nurture others in the living word of faith and the knowledge of grace, which was taught to you. And every parent should do that to their child. You should teach them how to work out their own salvation once they become saved. In other words, it's called changing your behavior, your attitude, your aptitude, and your character so that your life will look like you are a born-again believer and you love Jesus. So that your language will look like you're a born-again believer and you love Jesus. What would that look like today? Let me just bang on this just for a minute. I'm just saying me. You know, you got to keep some things off Facebook. Amen. Nobody's interested in your pink underwear. Are you listening to me? Nobody's, and then all of a sudden, your capture says loving Jesus. You got to be kidding me. I mean, you got to be kidding me. You know, I mean, ain't, ain't my, there's no modesty nowhere. I'm just saying. So, can, can we just take a moment where y'all smile at me? <laughs> are, are you listening to me? And yet we put all kind of scripture on stuff like that. And, and you know what it says to a younger generation? Jesus don't mind. Jesus just loves everything. The spirit of pride is often undetected. It's an evil and a cruel, and it is cruel as cancer. It slowly steals, kills, and destroys. It is a seducing spirit that causes spiritual miscarriage, 
of divine purpose and destiny. Jesus said it was a thief. Jesus said this thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy. John 10.10. 10. Now listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, when the thief comes, he does not come except. In other words, there's an exclusion to the rule. He violates the law. He violates the rule. And Jesus says, when he comes, he says he's not going to come unless there's something to steal, kill, or to destroy. Some people and some charismatic circles think the devil does everything. The devil, you know, remember Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. You know, I mean, it's just a devil, it's a demon. Everything is a demon. You know, I mean, nothing is just bad character, unlearned behavior, or stupidity. You know, everything is just a demon. It's just a demon. Well, the demon, I told you there was a wall there. What, the demon made you walk into the glass? I mean, you, you understand what I'm trying to say? And so we get so, so messed up in our mind that we, we, don't learn, we don't learn good behavior. Why? Because it wasn't taught to you. doesn't mean you can't learn it. Or, 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 and because it's a learned behavior, it has to be a learned way of thinking. Just like hopelessness. Hopelessness is a learned behavior. People learn to be hopeless. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? They learn to be hopeless. So Jesus said the thief doesn't come except. So when is this thief coming? When there's something to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. When there's nothing to kill, steal, and destroy, he ain't coming. So let's get this out of our mind and blaming everything on the devil. The devil probably laughing. Boy, they got me on that name. Blame I wouldn't even know where around. Are, are you listening? But it's easy to say that because we become proficient at using scripture to qualify our dysfunction in life. It's easy to blame it on somebody else. Look what he says. The spirit of pride caused a root of bitterness that sprung up in Lot's heart and defiled his wife and perverted the minds of his two daughters. Turn to the book of Genesis. Go, go back there. Genesis chapter 13. You know, Lot was Abraham's nephew. God never told Abraham to bring Lot with him anyway. You hear that? God never told him to bring Lot. Abraham did it. And Lot has been nothing but a thorn in Abraham's flesh ever since he brought him. I, I listen to me. And I see some of y'all thinking about some of your relatives. You know, there's been a thorn in your flesh. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm going to move to Rockford. You're like, oh, come on. And they, so anyway, let's go to Genesis chapter 13. Look what it says in verse 1. It says, then Abram went from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that they had, and lot with him. So they journeyed to the south. And Abram was very rich in livestock, silver and in gold. Now, Abraham was very rich in livestock. Now, keep that, in silver and gold, but he was still poor before God. He was rich before men, but poor before God. And a couple of chapters later, God says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. You know what God told Abraham? He said, Abraham, I'm going to make you wealthy. He was rich. He was rich. He had over 300 trained so, uh, servants that went with him. That means camel, tent, children, wives. So he had food, supply, all of that going across the Sahara Desert, all of that going across the desert. So he had to be rich to feed all those people. So he was wealthy. He was rich in silver and gold. And God says, no, nah, you poor before me, Abraham. I'm going to make you wealthy. I don't know about you, but that's a good place to stop and lift my hands and God make me wealthy. I'm going to help y'all. God, make me wealthy. See, that should be coming out of your mouth. God, make me wealthy. See, God can do it. Abraham didn't have no need for money before men, but God said, you're still poor before me. I'm going to make you wealthy. Mm -mm -mm. Man, I love it. And he, and he went on his way from the south as far as Bethel, and a place where his tent was at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. And the place where the altar which he had made there at first. And Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, so Lot, Lot knew something about praying, also, who went with Abram 
um, who had flocks and herbs and tents. And now the land wasn't able to support them and that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great and they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen and Abram's, and Abram's livestock and herdsmen and, and they were at this place called, called Perez. And I get this now, they, were, they had these Perazadites who lived in the land. I don't have time to talk about them, but I would like to. And they dwelled in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. He says, for we are brethren. In other words, we're kinfolks. He just says, is not the whole land before you? Please separate yourself and take. He says, he says, please separate from me. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. And if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord. He says, like the land of Egypt as far as you go towards Zor. And Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan and Lot journeyed eastward. And they separated from each other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent as far as Sodom. Now keep that in mind. I want you to see the difference between the two men. Lot pitched his tent, but Abraham built his altar unto the Lord. That's a very important point. Let's go to verse, um, verse 13. And the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked. Lot chose the wicked place to go and sinful against the Lord. Now, I want you to keep in mind, Lot had a spirit of pride that raised up in him. He never was rich before until his uncle took him and brought him and his family all that he had. And they traveled and he went with his, he went with his, his, his uncle. He had the promise of God in his life. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he is so blessed. Now, can you imagine having so much cattle, so many lambs, so many sheep that are the whole land didn't have enough room for you? Come on. Thank you Jesus. Now, now, there's a farmer back there. He raised livestock. He understands. That's a lot of land and a lot of cattle. As far as you can see, and the whole land, there wasn't enough water. There wasn't enough grazing. There wasn't enough to feed all of their livestock. That's amazing to me. And so God said, lift up your eyes. Abraham said, lift up your eyes. Where do you want to go? Oh, the land is pretty over there. It's got water. It's got spring. Oh, my God. It is just wonderful. Listen to this spirit of pride raised up in him. And later on, we're going to stop here, but later on down the line, he goes to the city that he wants to live in. He stays in the city. So God says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he sends two angels there, and Lot says, oh, man. He says, uh, this, this is not a good place. And he goes there, and he sets himself up as a judge in the city. He wasn't voted as a judge. He set himself up as a judge. You know, you know kind of like today. You know, you know, Kamala wasn't voted as president, but she's setting herself up. But I'm just using that <laughs> as, as an example. Are you listening to what I'm saying? They set in the gate and set themselves up. Listen to the spirit of pride. And then all of a sudden, the angels come, the fire fall, brimstone fall, destroys the city. The angel says, get out of here. Don't look back. Mm -hmm. He gets out with his wife, and she looks back, and she turns into a pillar of salt. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then his two daughters say, oh, we ain't going to have no husband. So they get their father drunk and lay with him. Yeah. Up come kids. The rest was for next week. <laughs> Come on, stand on your feet. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to repeat this prayer to me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I repent of pride, double mindedness, arrogance, and a haughty spirit. And I ask you to forgive me. I renounce. Every spirit of darkness, every curse working in my bloodline, and I call for the blessing of God 
to overcome it and to deliver me from rejection, shame, bitterness, and every root. And I thank you, Lord, that by your stripes, I'm healed. My bloodline is healed. My children are healed. They'll walk in the blessings of God all the days of their life. This is my confession, and this is my decree. According to your word, I believe it, I receive it, I act upon it, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. God bless you. I bless you in the name of the Lord, and have a great day and a fantastic week. God bless you.